Lift my eyes up and where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we just declare that Jesus, you are the way. You're the only way. You are the life. You are the salvation. You are the deliverer, God. There's no one but you. And so we just declare you're holy, holy, holy this morning, Jesus. You're holy, Father. There's no one that compares to you. So we don't look to our own um, methods We don't look to our own sources. We don't look to a human strength, but we look to you, Father, and we declare and we decree that you are the only way. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the only one that's ever been able to set free. You're the only one who's ever been able to bring life because you are the creator of life. And so we declare that you are good, you are great, and you are worthy of all of our praise and all of our attention today. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you come And we don't just give you room, but we give you the room to do whatever you need to do, Holy Spirit. You are the one who knows all, who sees all. So do what only you can do in our hearts today. Transform our minds today. Bring freedom today. Bring breakthrough today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So good to see you. Go ahead and grab a seat. All right. Amen. Amen. So good to worship with you. So good to have technology like air conditioning. It's a good thing. Thank you, Jesus, for people that were smart enough to come up with an idea like that. (laughs) So good. Well, I hope you're surviving the heat wave. Welcome to Tucson, Arizona. That's what it feels like, like Western Washington people are like, wait, this isn't supposed to happen. This is when Western Washingtonians panic, right? When you see, I mean, in the summer, when we see a week of like nearing 90 degree weather, people start to cower in fear. When you see a couple of days over 100 that only happens like once or twice in a generation, maybe, then people are like, I don't know what's going to happen. It's probably going to be blackouts. Military's going to roll in. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Uh, Anyways, I'm just having some fun. I'm excited to preach today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Ryan Williams, and uh, Pastor Justin and Kara, our senior leaders, are on vacation, and so we're just wishing them well, and I know they're having a great time. But I love to preach, and I love to preach on the subject of Jesus, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. We've been in this series in the book of Ephesians. We're going to be there all summer. Ephesians... um, is one of my favorite books in the New Testament. It's probably, in my opinion, one of the most powerful books written in the New Testament just in what it proclaims and what it teaches. And so today we're going to start in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I've titled this message, Life in Jesus. Exactly what we were just singing about and worshiping God for, that life is in Him. And so I'm just going to start by reading the first part of this passage. The Apostle Paul says, as for you, that's you and me, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and its thoughts. Pretty intense way to start a chapter uh, with the subject of death and sin, but that's the truth, you know? I think death is one of those things that nobody wants to talk about. I mean, who wants to talk about it? It's not fun. It's weird. It's creepy because we don't understand it. We know that we all are going to die someday, but nobody wants to talk about it, you know? But I'm just going to use what the great late Fred Rogers used to say, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. (laughs) If you talk about it, you can manage it. And I think so much, even in our Christian life, we, we don't talk about the things that make us uncomfortable, and death is one of those things. But Paul says, hey, listen, the truth of the matter is you were dead before Jesus. 
And if you're still living life pre-Jesus, you're dead, spiritually speaking. Dead in your sin, dead in your trespass, in your transgression, you were dead. Not just non-existent. See, this is what, you know, like an atheist in a kind of morbid way takes comfort in the fact that when you ask them, well, what's going to happen at the end of your life? They'll just say, well, I'm just not going to be here anymore. There's almost a a weird kind of comfort in that, you know? Um, I won't have to suffer through this meaningless life anymore because I'll just, I won't exist. But there are things worth worse than non-existence, and it's existing in a state of death. Are you getting what I'm saying? Paul is saying, before Jesus, you exist in a state of death. Not just not being existent, you are dead in a very deep and real way. You are without hope. You are without truth. You're without the ability to produce good and righteousness in your life. No matter what you try to plant, it doesn't come upright because only thing you can sow is death. Just being real. Without Jesus, the Greek, Greek describes us as living corpses. It's pretty, pretty descriptive. I mean, I guess it's a wonder. I mean, that's why zombie movies have always been so popular. We, we're drawn to what, we're, what we know. Right? We are living corpses. We're in a state of spiritual death. We're unable to think, to will, or to act on what is true, what is right, and what is holy. The condition of our souls, our mind, our will, our emotions, they're weak, they're unable, they're incapable, and they're corrupt. Paul described this state of spiritual death like this. He said, we had no ability to do anything but follow the corrupt and unfulfilling ways of the world, follow the spirit of disobedience and rebellion, the master of that being the devil, and follow every craving or desire of our sinful nature. We existed in slavery to darkness and death. I was telling the youth Uh, this last week about this passage and it brought up to my memory y'all remember Pirates of the Caribbean like the movies when they came out how cool that was and the first movie The Curse of the Black Pearl the governor's daughter gets kidnapped put on a pirate ship Captain Barbosa comes out steps into the moonlight and turns into like a skeleton and she's like well what did I just get myself into see they all looked alive but then The moonlight exposed them for what they really were, dead men, right? And she goes into his cabin, and he explains, we're cursed because we eat, but the food turns to ash in our mouths. We drink, but our thirst is never quenched. No matter what we do, we're never satisfied. And that really is a great description of the state of spiritual death and bondage to sin that we're in. We, we live this lie that says, if I can just pursue this desire, if I can pursue this corrupt thing, even though I know it's not good for me, if I can just like feed my appetite, maybe I can quench it. But the problem with sin is sin never stops growing. Its deceptiveness is, well, all you have to do is just give in this one time and just satisfy your craving, satisfy your desire, and you'll be fine. But the problem is sin always takes us further than we're willing to go because our craving is never satisfied outside of Jesus. That is the state of death that we live in. We're slaves to sin, the Bible says. Without Jesus, that is. You know, Paul talks about this doctrine of sin nature in this passage. And it's, it's the understanding that every person born into this world is spiritually dead and spiritual life must be given by the Holy Spirit of God. There's no other source of true spiritual life other than Jesus. That's truth. No other source of true spiritual satisfying holy life than Jesus. It comes through him and him alone. So we got to come to terms with the fact that dead is dead. 
I think sometimes, even for us as Christians, we, uh, we're good at painting our faces. We're good at looking alive when in reality, inside, there's a lot of death going on. But dead is dead. Whether you've been dead for five minutes or five days, you're dead. There's three examples, three very vivid examples of Jesus raising three dead human beings back to life in the New Testament. Uh, He talks about, uh, let's see, Jairus' daughter, who was a synagogue ruler, comes to Jesus in the street and says, my daughter is dying, she's 12 years old. But by the time Jesus is making his way back to Jairus' house, she's already passed away. And the servants come and say, don't bother bringing the teacher here because she's already passed on. And Jesus says, don't worry, let's go. He actually says she's only sleeping. And everybody's like, who is this? Is he crazy? So she's been dead just a little while, still in her bedroom. But Jesus comes in, simply takes her by the hand and says, little girl, arise. And she wakes up. And then the second account is Jesus is walking into a city and there's a funeral procession procession already in progress. A young man, is be, his coffin is being escorted outside of the city gates to be buried. Jesus stops the procession at the city gates because he sees this mother who is a widow who is in deep distress and he has compassion on her and he says, don't be sad anymore. He stops the procession. He puts his hand on the coffin and he says, young man, rise up. And he gets out of his coffin. The third example is the most famous one and that's Lazarus. Lazarus, there's no denying that he's dead because he's been dead for four days. And by the time Jesus makes it to the scene, the stone's already been rolled in front of the tomb, and Mary warns Jesus, why would you go in there? It's gross. He's been gone for four days. Jesus rolls the stone away, and he commands Lazarus, come forth. I love this. I love this because Every single one of these situations, whether it was five minutes or five days, everybody is dead in the middle of the story except for Jesus. I think the imagery here is there's death and then there's diff. And I think in our lives, sometimes we're satisfied because our death really, de- we're, we're, we don't really look dead yet. You walk into a bedroom of a 12-year-old girl who's been gone for five minutes And she still seems to be there. Mom still gives her a kiss on the cheek. Dad hugs her face. Jesus walks into the room. There's nothing to be grossed out by. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's a little girl who looks like she's asleep. But she's still dead. Then you have a man who's being carted off in his coffin and on his way to his tomb. And Jesus says, stop. I know what you're on the way to, but it stops here. And then you have Lazarus who's been gone and people, you ever, those people that are so bound up in their death that nobody wants to be around them anymore? Those people that are like, hey, don't, don't even like associate with that guy because he's, he's crazy, right? There's people that their sin is so public and gross that everybody pushes away from them once it's found out. But Jesus is still willing to walk inside that tomb and say, come out. So that's a message for us as Christians. If we're Christians in this room, it doesn't matter if somebody looks pleasant or it doesn't matter if their sin outwardly is so gross that we just want to walk away. Jesus would say, preach life, show life. Preach the gospel. Love people anyway. I don't care if it's been five minutes, five years, 50 years. You know what breaks my heart the most is when I talk to people about Jesus and they tell me something like, it's too late for me. It's never too late for Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Death is death. And without Jesus, we all stink. Amen?
Romans 8, 2 says this. It says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. One of my favorite passages. See, because before Jesus, God has laws that he sets forth in our life, whether we believe in him or not. It's the law of sowing and reaping. What a man sows, he will reap. If you want to sow death, if you want to plant death, if you want to plant sin, you're going to reap the manifestation of those things in your life, which is death. It's the law of sin and death. Anything associated with sin brings death with it. But then Paul says, but the law of the spirit of life set me free from that law. It raised me up to new life, just like God raised Jesus up to new life. So when you accept Jesus, you you accept the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit into you. You are regenerated like Lazarus out of the tomb into a person that walks in life from that point forward. And yeah, we still have our struggles, but the law of sin and death no longer has mastery over us. The spirit of righteousness, the spirit of truth, the spirit of freedom has mastery in our situation. I don't know about you, but for me, I found myself being so frustrated at my own inability to do the right thing. Have you ever just been honest enough with yourself to be there where you're like, man, I'm really horrible at making the right decision. I'm really bad at having the right attitude. Like I know the attitude I should have, but it's not there. I know what I should say, the right thing to say, but I say the complete opposite. It's like people go through life. It's It's that situation where everybody wants to do good, everybody wants to be good, everybody wants to be successful, but nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody wants to have a good family. I've never heard somebody walk up to me and say, you know what, I, the idea of family, I hate it. I, the thing that I love is just doing life alone, bitter and hurt. The reason people say they hate it is because they've never been able to achieve it in the right way. So they distance themselves from it. But the problem is, it's because when we're walking in the law of sin and death, no matter what you're trying to plant, even though your intentions are good, you might be trying to plant success in your life, prosperity in your life, but the only thing that's growing up is the weed of poverty. You might be trying to plant long-lasting, healthy family, but the only weed that seems to grow up is bitterness or divorce or tension. Which law are we living under? Jesus, in the parable of the sower, said, you know what? The wheat grows, but the tares grow up with it. The wheat only comes from the Spirit of God. Because the Bible says that the only imperishable seed comes from the truth that is the word of God. Everything else is perishable and corruptible. And so no matter if our intentions are good or not, no matter if we want the right thing, if the goal is good, if we're not planting it through the spirit of life, it's going to come up corrupted. All right, sorry if I'm being too real. Unless we move into life with Jesus, we begin operating through the Holy Spirit, that spirit of life, we're still under the law of sin and death. We're still planting seeds that are corrupt before they even hit the soil. Here's the good news. You want to get to the good news? (laughs) This is the good part. Like, we got to talk about the reality of death, but here's the even better reality. Mercy stepped in. Mercy stepped in. Paul starts off with all the bad news. (laughs) Hey, you want to, I'm just going to shoot straight with you. You're dead without Jesus. You're corrupted. You're stinky. You're rotten. You have no other ability to do anything but follow your sinful cravings and desires. But then he goes on in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Well, this is still kind of bad, but here we go. Like the rest... (laughs) We were by nature, in our own sinful nature, we were objects of the wrath of God. But, okay, that is a huge but. (laughs) 
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Oh, that's good news. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. This is, this is where Christians get a little bit distasteful, in my opinion. We all think that God, before we accept Jesus, hates us. Right? This is why people fear church. This is why people fear Christianity. This is why people think they hate God because they think God is just pursuing people in his wrath because by nature, that's what we deserve. We're just gross, disgusting, rotting corpses that he's just waiting to bury in a hole somewhere really deep. And then we somehow find Jesus in the midst of all that. And then he's like, oh, never mind. Good, you found the right thing. You cleaned yourself up. It's all good now. No, what Paul is saying is, by nature, we were objects of wrath. God had every right in his justice and in his truth and in his holiness to just wipe us out completely. But why didn't he? Because he chose mercy instead. Because he said, there's going to be a third option. It's not just going to be either you were with me from the beginning or it's just going to be death and destruction. It's going to be Jesus. And, he, and the Bible says Jesus was the plan from the foundations of the earth. Yes. Come on. That the Son of God would be born and he would sacrifice in his perfection himself so that we had another way out, so that we could be adopted as sons and daughters again, so that we could be joined with the spirit of life instead of the law of sin and death. It says we were objects of wrath, but God, because of his great love and his mercy, he made us alive with Christ. Woo! And you, we got to understand that because so many people, even Christians, are so scared to bring out the stuff that is dead in them because they think that if it gets exposed, then God's going to smite them or their fellow Christian brother or sister is going to smite them and they're going to be excommunicated. But listen, the gospel tells us that even though you were dead, even though you do stink, Jesus in his love and his mercy and his grace is still pursuing you. He pursued you even while you were still dead. Before you even knew who he was and what his love was and what the word said about him and what the word said about you. In his mercy, he made us alive with Jesus. God could have acted in wrath, but instead he sent Jesus. I just want to invite the worship team back up. But here's the thing. Here's, here's what I want to say to, to those who are Christians in the room. We've got to remember. We've got to remember that we were dead. Jesus made us alive. Nothing else is added to that. You were dead. Jesus, by his grace and his mercy and his love, made you alive. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We don't add anything else. When we do, it ceases to be the gospel. It just starts to become performance and the bad form of religion. And it, it starts to become, it starts to become embalming. How can I make this dead self look the most presentable so that people will still want to be around me for a while? Jesus said, man, you start walking into works and start walking into the law again. It's a bad thing. That's why he told the Pharisees, outside you look like whitewashed tombs, but on the inside you're nothing but dead bones. You don't understand where the source of life comes from. It doesn't come from your rule book. Ephesians 2 Paul ends it this way, 8 and 9. He says, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. There's no earning this salvation. It's not the number of service hours we've clocked. It's not the number of church services we attended, the number of good deeds we did, 
Our salvation comes through faith in who Jesus is and what he's done, not faith in who we are and what we've done. Come on. The world likes to preach a different message and sometimes I think Christianity buys into it too in our own weird way. You know, they, we say things like, have faith in humanity. Listen, I love people and I want to love humanity even in its brokenness just like Jesus did, but I don't have faith in humanity. I know what my humanity is like without Jesus in it and I don't got faith there. There's a reason Paul said, don't put any confidence in the flesh. We, the world likes to preach, you know, people deep down are good. No, deep down, you don't want to know what's in there. Because I know how, how far sin can corrupt us. So it's a nice sentiment, but it's completely untrue. I don't have faith in humanity. I got faith in Jesus, but it's, it's only by his grace, his love, and his mercy, and his spirit of life that I'm anything good that anything good comes out of my life. Come on, you gotta believe that. For those of you that are scared of God, you gotta understand in his love and his mercy, he's been pursuing you your whole life. He's not scared of your death because he has life that has power over death. So I don't care if you've been dead, five minutes. I don't care if the death is just in your mind right now. Your, your thought life, you, you feel dirty in your thought life because you're thinking about wanting to pursue these things that you know aren't God honoring. It's like the little girl in the bedroom. She's been gone five minutes and it just takes Jesus come grab her hand and say, rise up, little one. It's time to experience life. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're there and you just, you give those thoughts, you give that stuff internally that you've been, that's not public yet but you need to give it to Jesus so it doesn't manifest into deeper, deeper manifestations of what death can do. And maybe for some of us in the room, we're like Lazarus, where we're like, man, all hope is lost. Like I've been gone for so long, I don't even know what side is up anymore. But Jesus walks right into your tomb, right into your bondage and says, rise up because I am the resurrection and the life. I don't, ha I don't care how far gone you think you are. Jesus says, I can do anything because I am life. So maybe that's you this morning. And if you're there and in your heart, you've never really been able to accept Jesus into your life, accept him as the Lord of your life, because honestly, you've just thought, God has just followed me around with his wrath, and it's just a miracle that I'm still alive. Um, it's a miracle that he hasn't found me out yet. I'm here to tell you, God knows exactly where you are, who you are, what you've done, and he loves you despite yourself. And he wants Jesus to come in and transform you so that you can start to operate under the spirit of life instead of the law of sin and death. He sees all the areas of your life that you've tried to plant in your own effort and your own strength, and it just keeps coming up weeds. And God says, I'm gonna teach you how to plant crops that will produce a hundredfold what you produced before. It's gonna be a hundredfold worth a life, not death. Amen? So we get to take communion together this morning. How awesome is that? So I want to invite you to grab these elements with me. Open those things up if you can. I had to work on mine halfway through the message. But there it is. Thank you, Jesus. It's because of this that we're alive. No other reason, right? Man, I mean, it's so freeing to just be able to admit it's nothing that I did. It's all the love of Jesus. It's the grace of God. It's his mercy. I deserve death. I deserve to be condemned. I deserve to not have the beautiful things in my life that I have, but Jesus stepped in. Knowing that he was going to his death and it was gonna be painful, but it says for the joy set before him. What's the joy? Knowing that people get to walk out of their chains again. And he raised up, oh, I'm getting shaky, sorry. He raised up that cup and he said, this is my blood. This is the cup of a new covenant. My blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. 
in this blood, we're going to dismantle and demolish the contract that the devil thought he had over you for all of eternity. Sin and death and destruction. The devil always comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you can have life and have it in abundance. And that's what my blood is. It's life abundantly for you. So Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for that perfect, holy, sinless blood that you shed because of your mercy and your grace and your love for us. And it's because of your blood that we get to walk in freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you drink this with me? He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, when you eat this, do it to remember me. Remember that it's my body that's been broken for you. That the brokenness that you have walked through in your life, you don't have to walk in brokenness anymore. You get to walk in wholeness now because my body is gonna be broken for you. And this is what I love about the resurrection is that Jesus' body didn't stay broken. Three days later, he walked out of the tomb whole again. And for some of you, that think that your destiny in life is just to stay in your tomb and stay in your grave clothes. And even if Jesus does love you, don't come out of the cleft of that rock because if people really knew who you were, no, Jesus is calling you out. Come forth. I did this for you already. They thought that my body was gonna be beaten and it was just gonna decay in a tomb somewhere. But on the third day, on that Sunday morning, I came out whole, proving that death has no longer mastery over me. And if you join with me, your life, death will no longer have mastery over you either. So we just declare that every area of our lives that are broken, that are beaten beyond recognition. We thank you, Jesus, that your body was broken for us and you were made whole so that we could be made whole. I pray for every spiritual area of brokenness today. I pray for every physical area of brokenness today that people who are struggling with disease, with sickness, with ailments, with infirmities that they think they're just going to have to struggle with for the rest of their life. We just declare that Jesus, it's by your stripes that we can claim healing. And so we speak healing, 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 and wholeness over every situation in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's take the bread together. We're just going to worship, so would you stand with me? But before we worship, I just want to pray. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you that you are a God of mercy. You're a God of unconditional love. You're a God of grace. And because of your son, we get to walk in empowerment. We get to walk in grace. We get to walk in life that is abundant as we join ourselves with Jesus. Thank you. Father for that. Thank you that we get to leave this room today victorious, even though we may not feel it. We are victorious, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done, Jesus. And so, Jesus, we choose to lean into all that you have. We lean into your destiny for us. We lean in declaring that you're the one who created us for good works that you prepared in advance for us to do, not destruction, not death. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for life. Thank you for wholeness. In Jesus' mighty name, we worship you. Amen? Let's worship. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. setting sin, I will praise your name. Great is your 
is the greatest form of love that I personally have experienced. When my grave clothes were so tight 
from even what other people had wrapped me in. His love and his mercy came and so gently unraveled me. Cleaned me up and not in a performance way, in a very kind, loving, let me show you the way to full freedom way. And from that moment forward, my life has never been the same. It is an encounter that I have not just once, but over and over again encounter in my life. And that I stand today and I pray for people that are closest and dearest to me who are in the fight of their life. And I just keep speaking in faith. God, what you did for me, you can do for them. The way you love me, you love them. Because that's what someone did for me. Believed when I didn't, saw what I couldn't see. And just so gently came and took my hand, and I'm speaking of people now, and extended the love that Ryan so eloquently spoke of today and just tenderly walked me into encounters with the only one who could change my heart. They could hold my hand, but only he could change my heart. <sighs> so good. Excellent. Thank you for reminding us his faithfulness never ends, never fails. Our circumstances around us might feel like some people are failing us, but he never leaves us, never forsakes us. Amen? Amen. Well, I hope you encountered the God of hope today. I definitely did. <laughs> Amen. Amen, amen. Woo! You know, every time I get to do this I, on Sundays, every time I'm here, I'm like, I'm so glad I get to be here again. <laughs> if you'd like to stay in this cool room for a second service, we invite you to go ahead and do that. If you would like to come and join us in this cool room for second service, we invite you as well. Amen. Well, I think... Uh, Pastor Ryan even just talked about, if this is the first time that you have encountered the God of hope today, or if you're wanting more just information about your walk with him, uh, we have a couple ways to do that in the back of your chair, or if you're online, you can go to our website as well. There's a connect card. We would just love to get to know you. You can fill that out. There's a place on here if you need prayer, if you have something to share, you can just put it in the black box right as you go out our foyer doors there. And we also have a book. Look, it's not very thick, okay? When I know sometimes when I, we say book, I'm like, oh, not another thing to read. It's very small. It's awesome. It's power packed. It's called Fresh Start. We would love to put this in your hands um, if you are are uh, needing just a little more on your journey. So you can also find those back at our connect table in the back there. I know we say it, but we're going to continue saying it. Stay connected with us. We have some really awesome ways. You can uh, find us on our website. There's a place where you can uh, sign up for our newsletter, download our app, our app, our app, our app. We um, are right in the middle of doing an awesome uh, devotion together on Ephesians. So everything that our pastors are preaching um, in the coming weeks and the couple weeks back, we're doing together. And uh, we have some awesome 
um, leaders in the church that are doing some devotionals and uh, they're being sent to the app. So you can stay connected with us through there as well. You can also give in all of those places. Um, a couple of announcements. Okay, next Sunday is July 4th. Put this in your brain. We have one service. We have one service at 10 a.m. And then we have an awesome party following our service immediately from 11 to 1. It's our freedom party. If you have never been to our freedom party, it is so fun. We're going to have a field full of blow up slides and games and all sorts of things. We're going to have burgers, things to eat. We want to feed you. So it's like the pre-party before the big party. So you don't have to cook anything. Come be with us. We would love to host you. We've got some really, really fun things going on that day. So um, it's going to be a really great time. So one service, 10 a.m. Don't forget, if you do, I mean, you'll just kind of land either early or a little bit in the middle. <laughs> we also have our uh, GHC Summer Kids Club. If you have kids in K through fifth grade, starting um, Wednesday evening, July 7th, all the way through August 25th from 7 to 8.30, we have an awesome team of people who are going to be running our kids club. You can go to our website, generationalhope.org forward slash kids to get more information and register your kids there. Um, it's very important that you get them registered so that uh, we make sure we kind of put them in the right places where they need to go. Awesome. Hey, can I have our prayer team? If you're on our prayer team, can you come on forward? We have a really great team um, that if you are just needing prayer, if you need some encouragement, you just need someone to lay their hands on you, uh, we invite you to come up after the service and uh, they would love to pray with you, just give you a word of encouragement if you need that. So thank you so much. The last thing that we're going to ask, we're trying so hard for our second service to keep this room as cool as we can. If you could exit through our foyer doors back through here and not through these doors, that would be so awesome and helpful for us today to try to keep this as cool as possible. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. God bless you today. Stay cool. Enjoy the sunshine and enjoy your families. Amen. Amen.